This is Isaac Steinkamp from the Chess Summit Network, and for today's video I wanted to share a game I played on ICC, or the Internet Chess Club, and I wanted to talk a little bit about accumulating opening advantages. Um, a lot of times amateur players in tournaments are going to see their opponents deviate from book uh, for some club line or some pet line or some weird sort of gambit, but a lot of these moves aren't positionally sound, and I think that this game here that I'm going to show today will do a good job of explaining how to take advantage of these sorts of mistakes. Sorry, here we go. As you may know, I'm an avid English fan, so I played 1c4. He played a French, played knight f3. For those of you guys who are worried about d takes c4, I always have queen a4 check for working the king and the pawn, so I'll always get it back. Or I can play a double-edged move, knight a3. So in both cases, I'm going to get back the c4 pawn. Everything's totally fine. So my opponent plays knight to f6, bishop g2, just continuing my natural development. My opponent plays b6. Knight castle, and he plays bishop b7. So, so far, we're in a very equal position. Um, but I do know at some point, my opponent might want to contest this light square diagonal. In order to do that, he's going to have to get this d5 pawn out of the way. Because as of right now, this light squared bishop is just staring at the back of this pawn. So that means I always have to consider d takes c4 in my analysis. And seeing that my opponent's next move is probably either knight bd7, c5, or knight c6, I decided to play b3. This way, Instead of waiting a move and losing the option of queen a4, I always can just play b takes c4 in the case that he takes on d, uh, d takes c4. So everything's very solid. He plays land on b to d7. And I played bishop to b2 immediately, controlling the e5 square. So if we go back a move, and let's say I played the move e3, just to stay in tune with the natural structure of this line, I might run into trouble with this move e5. And the reason why that is, is he controls the center very easily. Now in this case, I might be able to exploit the d5 square, but in most French structures, if they can achieve d5 and e5 and have no problems in the position, then I'm probably worse. So rather than dealing with those lines, I just played bishop b2, covering up all the dark squares in the center. He plays c5, this is main line, and I play e3. All right, so what's the point of e3? Well, with e3, I control the d4 square, so he can't shut down the dark square diagonal and then play e5. So this move is critical for that reason. Another reason is, at some point, I would like to play d4 and open up these two files. But in order to do that, I'll probably want my rooks to be able to get onto c and d files easily. So by playing e3, I create this nice escape square on e2, queen e2, so I can play rook on f to d1. So my queen's off the open file, and I can get my rook on a nice file in the center. So that move has two purposes. Okay, bishop d6. I don't like this move. Why is that? Okay. So right now, in this position, this bishop on d6 is unprotected, or you might like to call it loose. So my, this knight right here ideally will go to c3. And from c3, I'm already threatening knight b5, kind of tickling this bishop, forcing it to go backwards, losing tempos, right? And generally, you don't want to move uh, pieces twice in the opening. And for my opponent, having a bishop on b8 doesn't really pose any advantages. In fact, it disconnects the a8 rook. So, after I play a move like knight a3, my opponent has to knight c3, my opponent has to consider a move like a6, wasting a tempo to stop knight b5, and that could be critical later in the game. So I played queen e2 now. I didn't want to play knight c3 immediately because it might give him the e5 move. But by playing queen e2, I prepare to trade him d5, play knight c3, maybe knight b5, and get my rooks on the two files. So queen e2 I thought was a very sound move. And then my opponent starts to deviate a little bit h5. I was under the impression here that he probably wanted some sort of caveman attack with like maybe a potential g5 push in the future and then h4 and then just try to attack this h, uh, this g3 square thanks to this dark squared bishop. So I was watching a video a couple of weeks ago and it was made by chess.com and it was made by uh, Fide Master Mike Klein and one of the things that he said was you know if your opponent wastes a move on the side of the board you get my permission to waste the side of the board and I think that this is one of those cases. Rather than allowing for complications and allowing for him to push this h-pawn further, I just played h4. This stops g5 completely because I have two protectors on that square, but at the same time, it's not quite clear how he's going to continue his attack. So here he went. He played knight to g4. Really dubious move. First of all, I had a hard time figuring out what this knight wanted to do from g4. Uh, and my best conclusion after calculating was he just wanted to control the e5 square. Now, you may have noticed that this bishop on g7 is hanging, so I have a decision to make. Do I want to take the pawn or not? So let's take a look at the pros and cons, because I feel like this was 
probably the hardest decision I had to make in this game. Let's say if I take on g7. Black has to move the rook, and I have to move the bishop back. So I went a pawn, and I didn't get my bishop trapped. So that sounds great. But what have I done? In getting rid of the g7 pawn, I've created a half open file in front of my king and wasted two tempos. Um, one of the things I like to tell some of my students is when you waste three tempos, that's about the same as one pawn. I've just lost two tempos for one pawn, and my opponent has a rook on a half open file with my king on it. This could be interesting because since I've played h4, this g3 pawn is a little bit weak, so by moving this knight to maybe h6, he might have some sack potential here on a g3. And this kind of made me a little bit uncomfortable. So I thought rather than playing into the hands of my opponent, let's ask him why is his knight really on g4? What is it really doing? This pawn on g7 will always be a weakness because it's on my nice dark square diagonal. So I just continued in my development. Knight to c3. Threatening knight to b5, but also at the same time preparing for my two rooks to go on these two central files, the d and c files. My opponent played rook g8, preparing some sort of g5 push or preparing for when I move my knight for this g7 pawn to be safe. But I just played knight b5. My opponent played bishop b8. If he had played bishop c7, I would have captured. And if he had played bishop to e7, his pieces are a little bit not coordinated. But it's not any better here with the bishop on b8. In fact, Black has already wait, uh, wait, made a rook move over here, so he's wasted his potential to castle kingside. And with a queen on d8 and a bishop on b8, good luck castling queenside. So while my opponent's trying to throw a caveman attack over here, I'm starting to formulate a plan for breaking down the center and getting my rooks where the king is, which is, I think, most important. My opponent's going to have a hard time of getting his rooks connected, so even if he does start a caveman attack at some, at some point with the move g5, he won't have a natural follow-up to be able to exploit the half-open file effectively. So I just continued. I played c takes d5, like in my plan. He played bishop takes d5. I thought it might be interesting if he played e takes d5 to work uh, the center a little bit, but with his king on e8, that's probably not a great idea. So he played bishop takes d5. I saw my opponent had a6, so I threw in d4. If he takes, I play knight b takes d4, and if he plays a6, then I can play move like knight a3 to c4, or maybe knight c3 attacking the light squared diagonal. Notice how this diagonal is very weak, and this rook on a8 is not a very safe piece right now with the bishop on b8. It's not easily protected if this bishop leaves this diagonal. So he took, and I took, and he played knight c5. Um, I don't know if taking was the best option, but it does allow him to put the knight on c5. So I thought maybe this was his best fighting chance. So how do you assess this position? My opponent hasn't followed any of the opening principles, his king's not very safe, his pieces aren't coordinated at all, his rook on a8 is not going to be moving anytime soon. So if you're white, are you really better in this position? It doesn't really look like there's a clear way to win. How do you break this down? My opponent has a nice hold of the e4 square, and he does have two attackers of the e5 square. So maybe to a casual observer, it might seem like black has some sort of initiative here. So. I did a little bit of thinking here. I just wondered what was my plan from the beginning of the game. I just played rook on a to c1. And my idea was, okay, black's pieces might look a little bit menacing right now. They're all pointing at the queen's side and they look a little bit dangerous, but he's almost down two rooks. This rook on g8 isn't doing too much right now. He still has to play g5 and then g takes h4 to make this rook meaningful. And this rook on a8 is not getting in the game anytime soon. So he's practically down two rooks. So in order for me to have an advantage, I need to develop all of my pieces. And I figured I should play rook on a to c1 before rook on f to d1 um, for a couple tactical reasons. Let's say my opponent plays knight to e4, controlling the central square uh, in this, on e4. By doing that, he gives me queen to b5 check. And if he plays the move queen d7, I have this nasty check, rook c8. And the queen can't take on c8 because of the pin. So that doesn't look too good. And if he plays a move like king e7, now his king is in the center, and bishop a3 might be interesting. Um, I hadn't fully calculated this out, but in all of the lines, black's king was very exposed, and it was just a matter of finding the right ways to get my knights into the game. Um, black's dark squares get very weak very quickly, and it's not quite clear how he's going to make any sort of counterplay on the king side. So... By playing rook on a to c1, my opponent's knight here on c5 is kind of stuck. If the knight moves at all, he can't play queen to d, uh, knight to d7 
or queen to d7 without opening up the c file and allowing for this pin to be a real threat. So my opponent played bishop to e4. So what is his threat? His threat is bishop to d3. But other than that, he's not really threatening too much. So I just continued with my plan. I just played rook on f to d1. Now if he plays a move like bishop d3, I can meet it with a rook takes d3, knight takes d3, queen takes d3, and my opponent is strategically lost. The reason why is this light squared bishop is very strong. I'm going to move this knight from f3 at some point and discover attack the rook on a8. And even though my opponent got rid of one of my rooks, this c1 rook is very strong, controls the c-file very effectively, and this queen is kind of stuck here on d8. At some point I might have queen b5 check, and if my opponent plays queen d7, I have rook c8 check. So not much hope for my opponent. So he didn't opt for that move. Instead he played queen to f6, trying to get the queen out of the way. But this move does have problems, and I'm going to ask you to pause the video here and try to figure out how to win the game for white. Black's made all the wrong moves at this point, principally af princi in terms of principle, after he made that bishop d6 move. How do you finally exploit um, your advantages and show why the rooks on the c and d file are so strong? Alright, well if you haven't solved it yet, I'm going to have to ask you to pause your video, but if you have, you might have seen the sneaky move, knight to c6. In the game, my opponent played queen to g6, and I had this nice checkmate, rook to d8. So, if he takes on b2, I obviously have rook d8 checkmate. And if he plays bishop takes knight, I take his queen, and the game is over. So, very quickly you saw how these two rooks became very menacing. And... You know, to an amateur, this position here might have seemed very equal, but it was a matter of accumulating all of my advantages, realizing that my ki my opponent's king hadn't castled yet, my opponent's rook on a8 was not going to move anytime soon, and this rook on g8 is not doing too much. You know, after rook on a to c1, and then rook on f to d1, you could tell very quickly this position had changed. And in terms of advantage, you know, here it looks fairly equal, and, you know, here... You can tell, like, I have all of the attacking play. So if you stick to principled play and you have a strong structure and you follow all of the opening rules, you're going to go places. Um, in this game, I just stuck to the center. I stuck to my main ideas. You know, when my opponent deviated and played a move like h5, I found the right response and played h4. And I just met all of his weaknesses with strong moves. With his bishop on d6, I found knight c3, knight b5. And when he didn't develop his king, it was just a matter of getting my rooks in the center. So when your opponent goes out of book next time and in a tournament game, always look for ways to exploit how to damage their position. Um, in this game, it was fairly easy. I just found a way to lock my opponent's king in and just played forcing moves. Um, so I hope with your games, when your opponent goes out of book, you can catch them by surprise rather than being on the surprised end. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is Isaac Steinkamp signing off for the Chess Summit Network.